Well, welcome everyone to Coffee Linux and time for another exciting interview with one of the larger than life personalities in the Salesforce ecosystem, uh, a friend of mine and a trailblazer, Robin Leonard. Thanks for joining us, Robin. Hey, Mark. Uh, great to be on, on your podcast. Uh, always a pleasure to chat. So why don't you give us a quick intro, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, then we'll dive into some some questions. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, super high level. Um, my name is Muff. I'm a Kiwi. I have been running this business for about 12 years. We started 2011. Uh, we actually started in the Philippines and built the business there. Uh, about five or six years into the journey, I moved down to Sydney and started the office there. And uh, it's been going very strong ever since. Uh, AF Digital is a Salesforce consulting business. So we specialize in helping clients um, implement their Salesforce and then operate it to get value from it. We have a very strong focus around helping clients get ROI from their Salesforce investment. And we often see that clients that buy Salesforce but then don't do much with it, that's really uh, the clients that need the most help because they they won't get the value or the return from that investment unless they implement it correctly and adopt it successfully. So we we really sp uh, we really specialize across uh, customer experience and everything to do with customer experience. Uh, so it's really the front end of the business. We help um, clients tweak that so they have a better conversion, a better acquisition funnel, and uh, much better retention around their customers. It's very interesting. You talked about customers that purchase Salesforce and don't do a lot with it. In customer conversations, I've often said, um, you know, for me being a petrol head, the analogy I use is it's like me going out and buying my dream car, which would be a Ferrari 458, and only using it once or twice a week. And I'm driving to the shops to get bread and milk, and I never take it over 60. I never get out of second gear. And I've got this incredible piece of technology and design that is being terribly underutilized. Is this yeah. something that you see a lot out there in your experience, Robin? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I actually liken it more to a tractor than a Ferrari, even though it's the Ferrari of business technology. Uh, it's I liken it to a tractor because a tractor is an asset for a business that the business will invest in. They'll pay good money for a good tractor. But yeah, if they don't use it to produce value or as part of the production process in the business, then it's really just sitting there on the side. And it may as well be a Ferrari because you're just paying for it and it's just sitting in your garage. And it's more about your ego of having it than the actual value that it's delivering to your to your organization. Yeah, I, my background as well is in, as you know, in consulting. So I spent four years co-leading a Salesforce partner business with a focus on analytics and spoke to hundreds of Salesforce customers in that role and in my current role. Um, I think it's, it's, very, uh, it's very sad, it's almost tragic how many customers are underutilizing the platform, don't even necessarily understand what could, could be done. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunately quite common. Why do you think that is? Why is it that there are so many businesses out there that have invested in the world's number one CRM and mm. have, have bought into the vision and are excited about automation and analytics and now AI. Why isn't it happening for them, do you think? Yeah, it's it's a million dollar question, to be honest. Uh, I, I think a lot of it, the root cause is a lack of understanding of the capability. So, you know, you may buy sales cloud thinking that it's sales cloud and I can, I can track my leads and opportunities, accounts, contacts, you know, those, those core features, that's my understanding of it. But the true nature of buying sales cloud is actually that I get access to a whole data model that suits my entire business, uh, in that same sales cloud model. It's just that most customers don't use it for that purpose. So, and, and you can even get full access to that data model with just one user license. So you don't need to spend a lot with Salesforce to get a huge amount of value, but to get that value, you have to adopt it and put that into your business process. So 
a lot of people that buy Salesforce, they, they only really recognize, oh, I bought Sales Cloud, therefore I should be using these major objects. But the reality is I bought Sales Cloud, I could run my entire business on this platform if I knew what I was doing. And, and I liken it to, uh, you know, it's, it's just that, that moment of awareness or learning as you kind of get, get past that big uh, gap, you know, and understanding you, you go, oh, if only I'd known this five years ago, I would have done it differently now. That's what we see with Salesforce uh, customers is when they start the journey, they have no idea. They implement Sales Cloud for what they think it's for. And then after a few years, they'll be like, oh, man, if we knew what we knew now, we would have actually done it quite differently. And we would have set this up and done this. And this is proven value. Um, so, yeah, I think it's lack of awareness. And I, I do think it is the responsibility of the, the board and the C-suite when they are making an investment in Salesforce, they need to also learn what are they buying. If they don't know, they're equally at fault of the, the failure and adoption of that technology. Because um, the information is there, like it's not like a secret, you know, it's just a, a lack of um, understanding. Uh, and I mean, you could even say it's ignorance when people buy buy Salesforce, they, they didn't really understand what they bought. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. So I'm going to switch gears now. You did mention earlier about your um, passion for customer experience. Things are changing very quickly. They always have, I think, in technology, but recently I feel like we've moved to an exponential period of growth and change. And it's even for those of us who work in technology, frankly, it's quite hard to, to keep up and stay abreast. What do you see in the future for customer service and customer experience? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh... The, I think for years we've been talking about the Ubers of the world and you, you guys have to keep up with those Ubers of the world because eventually customers will have the same expectation. That's been a common thread in the customer experience world for a very long time. I think that's even truer now than it ever has been and it's still a consistent story. It's, except it's not the Ubers, it's the startup down the road that has maybe got a better um, onboarding process for new banking customers than the bank does, or uh, a, a neobank that has maybe got a better um, front-end customer service while all the traditional banks are closing down their, their actual physical locations. So I think there's a, a, a near future where large organizations will be disrupted and are being disrupted by these startups that just have a, an eye on customer experience and they've provided the online tools where customers can get a better experience, self-service more, have more transparency, more access, all of those things. Large companies are struggling to make that experience happen because they've got all this legacy technology. So I think that uh, we are going to see that trend, you know, the, the Ubers of the world, but it's going to happen more and more. And even in my industry, you know, I know that I need to provide a better digital experience to my clients, even though I'm a B2B consulting company, that's the expectation they have because they deal with all sorts of different businesses that have the same level of experience. So yeah, I, I, I think it's just going to keep accelerating. Um, the technology is not hard and the ROI is obvious. It's not like, uh, oh, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. We know for a fact there is value and a, a huge benefit in not having a call center answering every query, but having a call center that answers only the queries that a chatbot isn't able to answer or a self-service login experience isn't able to um, support the customer with. And how do you see recent developments in things such as generative AI, um, LLMs, we, we could think of chat GPT is the obvious example. What impact do you see those having on uh, customer experience and the ability for the average business to adopt technology like this and really make a, a significant shift in how their customers are dealing with them? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. And it's a really interesting time in our society where we've got these uh, these new tools coming in. And they are going to disrupt everything more than we've ever seen before. Uh, there's a, 
a new approach with product design uh, called AI first thinking. So if you can design a product from an AI first, similar to how we went from like desktop to mobile, we started designing applications mobile first. It's the same thing with AI first. With AI, you don't necessarily need to hard code the scenarios in the program. I don't need to write the script for the chatbot anymore. Whereas before you had to think through what every single scenario could be that anyone would ask a chatbot and have have a, a user story for that. Now it's more about training the chatbot to answer whatever it needs to answer and, and then you know improving it over time. So it's a very different approach to AI than we had with uh, technology before. So I do expect there's going to be a lot of um, AI first startups that are going to disrupt um, traditional platforms. However, you've got the, the big business cloud technology platforms like Salesforce, Microsoft, Google, the what I see is that they will embed their uh, AI generative technology into those um, applications. So it it increases the availability to the clients. So the end customers, they will see AI in their day-to-day -day user interface that they've been using for the last five years or 10 years. So that's, I, I see that companies will adopt it through the major players as and a company or an enterprise is less likely to go to an, a startup and get that technology unless it's been very proven and safe. And, you know, so there's going to be a little bit of a, I think a separation. Our clients will still receive their AI technology through the sales forces of the world. And I'm really excited to see that change. I think that's going to be really great for Salesforce to embed AI throughout. It's going to make everything so different. Um, but yeah, I do see another landscape of startups that won't be as enterprise friendly to start. You know, you won't, a bank won't openly work with an AI native platform because it's just the controls uh, are not there yet. Um, but that will change over time. I think what we'll see is a bit of a, a race between the two, but certainly what we're seeing is the sales forces of the world that are investing heavily and making sure that their technology is, is AI native. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Looking back at various technology launches over the years, you know, there are those that never really lived up to the hype, um, such as, for example, I think virtual reality and augmented reality um, have never quite changed the world as, as they were positioned to do so. Uh, and yet there are others that almost overnight transform the way we live and work. And the obvious example for me would be um, the iPhone. You know, Steve Job gets up and talks about, you know, an internet explorer and a music player and a phone, three new technologies, but they were three in one and now comes this incredible device. And, you know, there are pros and cons to how it's transformed society. Looking at generative AI as a broad term, whether it's large language you know, learning models or whether it's around um, image generation, so many applications, um, do you think that it will live up to the hype? Do you really see it as transforming society do you see that it will make some jobs uh, roles redundant and create new roles do, do you feel like it really will live up to all the hype that we're seeing at the moment that's a topical question and i i may be a little bit extreme with my views uh i i actually anticipate that by the end of this decade we'll see agi uh which will largely mean uh, society is going to change dramatically. It's similar to um, singularity. I think that's what we'll expect potentially within this decade. So we've only really got six years uh, left of the world as we know it. So, and I, I don't know what will happen after that. Um, I'm optimistic that it will become a lot easier for humans and a lot of our problems will get solved. But I'm also equally afraid of the, you know, more negative consequence of, you know, applying AI to to warfare and, you know, all of those kind of things Terrorism will happen. Terrorism would be another example, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I'm very I'm stoic. I'm like it's 
either way, something's going to happen. But I think within this decade, we'll see uh, extreme change for the human species because of this technology. That's a very interesting um, point of view. I was recently uh, listening to a podcast uh, from someone who believes that AI is an existential threat. It, it, I think they quoted a, a number of a one in six chance of extinction level event, in fact. And at yeah. first I was taken aback and, and very skeptical, but just began to listen to why they held that point of view. And they also talked about a, a recent letter that came out uh, open letter, and it was from really some of the great minds in AI, such as the, the founder of OpenAI, for example, and, and other leaders in the space, uh, are very concerned about the possible uh, negative impacts. You know, we often think about AI in terms of things like customer experience, et cetera, but then there are those that are concerned about, um, you know, for example, imagine giving this technology to well-funded, passionate terrorist organizations. Just one mm -hmm. example that springs to mind. Um, so it will be very interesting to see how it all pans out. I'm interested to see how involved the government gets. The challenge we have is we live in such a fragmented world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to imagine there being a global um, quorum on the subject. But, um, you know, coming back to more of a, a business focused conversation. When you're talking about AI and you're talking about customer experience, you're talking about technology and automation, you know, every digital transformation is a data transformation. You can't mm -hmm. deliver great customer experience uh, without the right data at hand. And you're certainly never going to deliver meaningful AI without the, uh, you know, data that's, that's clean and, and complete and current, et cetera. So what do you see as the value of organizations managing their first party data well? Oh, yeah. So uh, I think a lot of organizations don't realize that their data is actually an asset. And if used correctly, it can generate a huge amount of value for the business. A lot of companies are just capturing the data. Uh, ideally, uh, many companies aren't even capturing the data, but ideally companies are capturing the data and the data provides a lot of information that can be used to optimize the way that we sell service and market to those clients. Um, for example, it's, it's kind of the same as say, if, if I was selling widgets and Mark, I've known you for 10 years and you come into my shop and I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. What's your name? And you're like, oh, it's, it's Mark. But you're like, why am I even giving you that information? What's the point? Because you're just going to forget it anyway. Every time I come in, you're going to be like, hi, nice to meet you. I've never seen you before. How can I help you? Whereas um, a company with data, it's they would go, Mark, how's your how's your wife? How, how's your family? Like, how's your new house? I, I know you just bought a house recently. How's that going? Um, you know, your pet's loving it. How's your son? You know, so a, a company that has collected that data and is using it appropriately will actually have a much better relationship with Mark because they'll be able to be efficient around the way they deal with him. They won't ask him to re-key his same information over and over again. They'll be respectful. They'll be empathetic to Mark and say, you know, instead of being like, Mark, would you like to buy this amazing red dress? It's going to look so good on you. And then you're like, wait, I'm a male. It's like, oh, <laughs> didn't know that. Okay, well, how about a suit? You know, it's a really dumb way of selling to people is just having no idea. And the, the worst thing is companies do have the data, but they're not using it. So I have, the company has seen Mark come in. They do know his gender. They do know information about him, but they still go, hi, nice to meet you. I haven't seen you before because that's, the data's not tied together. So it's, I know it's a very silly metaphor but that's how companies are dealing with their data today is they're actually not leveraging it and they're letting it sit there often they are, are reckless with how it's sitting there so they may be capturing it it may be going into 15 different systems as part of mark's journey and you know it, they may not have the security and control over one or more of those systems 
they may not be integrated. So if you're dealing with one system, you have to re-care. You've got another system, you've got to re-care. Maybe I've misspelt his name in one of the systems. I don't even know which one is true because it's just a, a mishmash of data and systems. So a smart company will recognize this and they'll build a single customer view in their CRM that has all of the information about Mark. It has all of the visits he's made to the shop. It has his gender. It has his um, his son's name. It has, uh, you know, how long has he owned the house for? Like whatever is relevant to what I'm selling to Mark, I should be capturing information about that so that I'm not uh, irrelevant or out of context when I speak to him. Um, but in the same vein, I've also got to treat that data with the care and respect because Mark owns it. He owns the fact that he is a male and that he's got a son. I, I shouldn't be taking that data without his permission. I shouldn't be using it without his permission. So being able to manage all of those things in an ethical way and an empathetic way to Mark, that's really the responsibility of a company. But most companies just have no idea and they are just they're just getting data in and all they think is like how am i going to make more money this month i've got to do a campaign i've got you know so it's um yeah i i think that's the key thing is companies recognizing what data is to them what is the value of that data and how do i use that data in an ethical and empathetic way to create value for the business yeah it's interesting i had an experience with uh, Apple uh, a couple of years ago and I went in to purchase something and I've been an Apple customer for a super long time, uh, decades. And when I was chatting with the, uh, the genius, they had their iPad there and I just happened to glance across and see my information on their iPad and it was all wrong. There was an address that was 15 years old I'd moved multiple times since then. And the phone number was one I'd never heard of. It wasn't my phone number, never had been my phone number. <laughs> and I paused the individual and I said, hey, you're going to need to update you know, this data. And I said, the, the phone number I've never heard of, the address is extremely old. And I knew I had updated it online recently. And I walked away thinking, one of the most innovative companies that there has ever been can't get this right, at least in this mm. example. How much yeah. more is it a challenge for your typical organization? And using that as a bit of a springboard, I'm often in conversations with organizations that want, you know, great analytics that's driving decision making. They want to be data driven, not driven by gut feel and consensus. They want to use AI, whether that's traditional machine learning or whether that's the generative AI, but you look at their data uh, quality. So completeness, mm -hmm. um, currency, uh, cleanliness, and it's awful. And you step yeah. back and, and ask the question, why are you doing such a poor job of managing that, that first, second, third party data? I think we often blame technology because it's easy to do that. <laughs> Let's blame mm -hmm. Salesforce, let's blame Microsoft, Google, whoever, you know, whatever the case may be. But I, I look at the three P's. I look at platforms, people, and process. And very often the platform does not control the, the data. Very, very often, probably majority of the time. So then you're coming back to people and process. Mm. What do you think are the main challenges that organizations face in those two areas. So I'll give you one example from my perspective. I found as a consultant that a company may have, let's say, a quarter of a million dollar budget for a transformative implementation of, say, let's say, up Service Cloud. And then you dive into that budget and you ask, how much have you budgeted for change management? How much have you budgeted for, for training? What's the plan for um, train the trainer and for in, internal champions and uh, what resources are available? And are you planning to use Trailhead? And all of these questions. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. very often, that's almost an, an afterthought. 
Yeah. What has your experience been in terms of the challenges with people and process resulting in, you know, the inability to manage that done well? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I, I came from a, an enterprise consulting background before all of the Salesforce stuff came out. So I was working on, in Vodafone on a, a half a billion dollar project to replace um, their old legacy CRM and billing platform with Siebel, which is now an old legacy uh, billing <laughs> Ethereum platform but yeah when we when we went through that project it was like lots of money was invested in process and people change like that was done as it should be done for an IT project you know there was a change man there was a change team there were process people there were um BAs and SMEs and SME leadership teams and you know it was the sufficient amount of investment to manage a change of all of these call center sales and marketing staff that's all it was it was the same as what we do today with salesforce the amount of uh investment i see in those things like process change and um uh, like people change is almost zero with salesforce it, i never see it to be honest unless it's yeah. like a big a or a telstra that's been my experience Most, as well right yeah yeah and it, i find it um ignorant and uh it's like not thought through like they they should think about these projects the same way they used to think about it projects the the fact is salesforce isn't seen as an it system quite often it's seen as a marketing or a sales tool so mm -hmm. often it's the marketing and sales team that will just get it in quickly with the marketing and sales budget the it department aren't focused on it and that's where i see if it was done properly with the proper it project governance it should be done correctly but often it's it skips the IT department and then it's just done by the and I think they lack the um, generally the maturity of a PMO internally to roll out a change like this. So, yeah, I, I think that's a key thing. And, you know, even a procedure document on this is our sales process. This is yeah, the your SOP, right? Your standard operating procedure. Exactly. And I just it boggles my mind. Um, I, I I often go back to Sun Tzu, um, the art of war, when mm -hmm. I think about this, because he has this one of his famous lessons is, you know, it's, um, it's not the person's fault if they screw up a process, if it's not instructed to them correctly. Um, and he has a, an analogy around, um, I think he had a concubine uh, or it's a, a harem of women that he had to manage for the, um, for the king and he gave them directions and they didn't follow him. So he clarified his directions and then they still didn't follow him. And he's like, okay, cut off the first two people's heads. So he had a very, um, but his lesson out of that was give them instruction. They still don't follow it. Make sure your instructions clear. Companies don't do that with Salesforce. They will give them sales cloud minimal training and mm -hmm. say, you're off, figure it out. And it's, it's not these people's fault if it fails. It's the directors and the sponsors that are funding the projects. When it fails, it's their fault for not correctly funding it because they should know at their level and their experience, they should know we need a process written. We need a change manager. We need even a business. Often they don't even have business analysts or project managers. Yep. So yeah, you've hit straight at the heart of my pain. But I just, I wish that there would be the education level at the boards to say, even though this is Salesforce, even though it's kind of out of the box, still requires the same level of diligence that an IT project would require. Yeah, there's some very astute observations there. I have the, the probably somewhat not unique, but um, unusual experience of having been a customer and then a consulting partner and now an employee of, of the technology <laughs> vendor, right? You've been around so I have, the whole time. Yeah, now. and I, I look back and I, I've had so many conversations with customers where the it isn't going well with CRM or analytics. And so they'll blame you. They'll blame the partner. Say it's AF Digital's fault. And they did a crappy job of the implementation. Or they'll blame Salesforce or, or Tableau and say, oh, the technology's, you know, it's mm. not fit for purpose and blah, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I step back and I have a, I have a bit of a mantra that everything rises and falls on leadership, mm. right? And a great leader will not blame 
third parties, right? Now he may uh, he may you know perform a uh, a cause and effect analysis and realize where things have gone wrong, but at the end of the day, he or she knows that it's their responsibility. They they own this, and mm. you know we're in twenty twenty three, not nineteen eighty three. So if yeah. you're in a position, whether it's a C suite or an MD or whatever, depending on the organization. If you're in a senior leadership position, as you said, you, you've got to be educated about what you're getting, what what you what you're buying. If there's a, a schism between sales and marketing and, and IT, then that needs to be bridged, and that needs to be your job to influence the organisation to make that take place. Um, mm. You need to make sure that there's um, adequate budget for that people and process, making sure change management and training. And uh, yeah, I love what you talked about, business analysts and SMEs and um, product owners and project managers, all of those roles are, are well cared for. Um, in my opinion, I, I'll go back up the chain and say, when you started on this journey and had this vision, what was the plan? And not just tactically, but strategically. How, how was this mm -hmm. thought through? Um, and often, unfortunately, technology, it is seen as a Band-Aid. Uh, it mm. is. And that's why so many companies have hundreds, hundreds of um, systems and platforms and tools that they're, that they're trying to use because every time they have a problem, they're buying another one. And like you said earlier, they may not realize that, hey, you know what, we've got Sales Cloud and we're buying a platform for service and then we're buying a platform for analytics and then we're buying one for messaging and marketing automation and, and e-commerce and um, you could actually all do that do all of that really well in one platform if you had the vision and the, the people etc yeah. Um, yeah i i think there is a there's there is a culture as well and maybe more so in the marketing department where they have an agency culture where I'm, I'm not really responsible. I'm going to use an agency. And if the agency does a bad job, I'll fire the agency and protect myself, which doesn't, it doesn't work at all with Salesforce. Cause it's really, as you say, it's like, they've got to adopt it. It's really up to them. It's kind of like going to a doctor and saying, I'm overweight. I need to lose weight. And we're like, Hey man, you've got heart disease. Like you really should, you know, take care of your body. And they're like, yeah, I know. But, you know, it's just so hard. And then they go away, they come back and they haven't made any changes themselves. And we're still saying, hey, you guys need to lose weight. It's the same thing when we're consulting. It's like, hey, you guys need a business analyst. You need a product owner that is responsible for this. You need a sponsor that knows what's going on. You need all these roles in your organization. You can't just pass the buck and say, let's get a new partner every year and then blame them. Because <laughs> they, yeah. those partners come in and do changes to your algorithm, like your business systems. And it's just not healthy to have people coming in and out of those. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that clients that get Salesforce, they have someone that gets it internally and owns the vision and says, this is what we're doing. And is very clear about it. That's where I've seen the most success with clients. Where I've seen a lack of success is where there's no clear ownership internally people are coming and going. So people are just like, okay, I guess I'm a user of, of Salesforce then. They come in and then they, they go out pretty quickly and the manager doesn't know anything about it. It's seen as just a tool that they use for one process. But ideally they should see it as a, this is an investment. If we build stuff out, then those the things that we build out on it should add value. Um, and there's even a lifetime to the value of what they build out. Like what we've been experiencing is um, one of our clients, we set up, uh, say three years ago, we set up a welcome journey for their customers and then they added on brands. So they had like three or four or five welcome journeys. After three years, we made the decision, let's just build one welcome journey that's dynamic across all of your brands. So they have to maintain one thing. So we actually end of life, the first journey that we built mm. and we've bought the first multiple. Now we've got that's one fun. that we had to create from scratch. Yeah. So the lifetime of the investment of that journey was three years and then it was retired and we had to invest in a new journey. And each one of those journeys that's set up, it's running every day. So you've got to have someone that regularly checks it. So there's kind of, I see it like a bit of a boat, you know, you buy the boat, it's a bit expensive, but then every year there's a 10% cost of maintaining the boat. 
the thing with Salesforce is that there's the Salesforce is a boat, but there's every time you build something, there's another boat that you've created that you need to maintain and optimize over time. And the but boat if you have evolving it, too, right? Because the technology doesn't sit still. Yeah, that's exactly right. And yeah, the, as you say, there's features that get released all the time that you just need someone to understand what they are, turn them on and train users right in SOP. And mm -hmm. then you can get the value from those releases. No mm -hmm. one's doing that. You're, you're just not getting the value out of Salesforce. And that's very common, isn't it? I see that very often. Mm. Look, Robert, it's been wonderful to chat with you. Uh, before we go, uh, I'd love for you to take a moment to um, let us know how we could go reach out to you personally, where we can find um, AF Digital, social channels, website, etc. Yeah, sure. So um, please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Robin Leonard, you should be able to find me there. Uh, otherwise, afdigital.com is our website. If you go there, uh, drop an inquiry and we'll have one of our team contact you back. Awesome. I'll be sure to add those uh, links in the comments as well, or in the description on the video. Robin, great to chat. Always enjoy it. Thanks again for your time. Thank you very much, Mark. Have a good day.